so, but at least we're here, and um, I think we can finally get started. So I just want to say good evening and welcome to Catholic Evangelization Outreach. Um, I think thank you out for coming on this beautiful Kentucky November evening. This is our second post-COVID shutdown event, and it's such a joy to be able to be here tonight and to welcome all of you. On behalf of the CEO team, I truly want to thank you for your continuing support. It means so much to us. Well, my name is Donna Lang, and I'm the coordinator for CEO, as I think most of you know. I want to extend a special welcome to anyone who has not been to one of our CEO events. Um, I hope you enjoy the evening, that you'll come back, that you'll perhaps invite somebody to come with you the next time you come. I truly believe that the stories of our guest speakers touch the lives of others in a very special way. And we've had feedback to that, to support that. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce Deacon Chuck Bent, who serves here at St. Margaret Mary, to open this evening with prayer. Deacon Chuck. There we go. All right. Well, as we gather here, I'm sure that if you're like me, you've been very hectic. That's like my sixth thing I've had to do today. Two board meetings and two masses and <laughs> some work. All right. Um, so, you know, it's been a very hectic day, filled with uh, distractions. So I invite us to slow down for a moment and to center ourselves, to clear out our minds. And in a moment of clarity, I would like us to take a moment and to think to ourselves of someone in our lives that we might want to pray for, someone that needs our prayers, and someone that needs to hear the message of God's love, someone that might need to hear this talk of how God reaches out to each and every one of us. So now let us bow our heads and pray. Gracious God, we pray that the good news of your gospel may prosper in, a, prosper in us and work through us into the whole world. Grant us freedom from all anxieties, especially from those in which we cannot control. Release us from all false occupation with ourselves, from all graceless response to others, from all disregard of serious questions, and from all need to prove others wrong in order to show ourselves right. Grant us increasing maturity and outlook and action so there may be space for your serenity and your vigor to control us more and more. Keep us quiet of mind and attentive in learning to a promise of your grace. Let us hear today the amazing story of Russell and learn how to model this in our own lives and to take your gospel to those in our lives that need to hear this message. We ask this through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Tonight we have a very special speaker who came all the way from Madison, Wisconsin to share his moving story of conversion to the Catholic Church. Russell and his wife Bonnie actually lived for a time in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where Roger and I resided for more than 40 years. We moved here almost eight years ago now. We didn't know the Younts at the time but I'm sure we would have attended some of the same CEO events throughout the city. After we moved here, I received an email from Russell asking if he could speak at one of our events. He had just spoken to a CEO audience at our former church in Cedar Rapids. After Russell contacted me probably three or four years ago now, he and Bonnie moved to Madison, and then COVID shutdowns intervened, so finally, they are able to be with us here tonight. Well, Russell serves as an accountant for the Diocese of Madison, Wisconsin. He's a native of Kentucky and a transplant to the Midwest. Russell entered the Catholic Church in 2004 
after three years of discernment. He has a passion for Catholic men's ministry, especially in the area of promoting virtue. Russell previously served the Knights of Columbus as a district deputy and was chosen as a delegate to the 2016 Supreme Convention in Toronto. His wife, Bonnie, is an elementary school teacher, and she completed her own journey to the church in 2006. She is actively involved with various ministries in their parish and community. So, without further ado, would you please welcome Russell Yount. Well, thank you, Donna, for that introduction. Well, good evening, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to, to be here tonight. We were cutting it a little bit close on time because a little more than 24 hours ago, we left La Crosse, Wisconsin, and now we're in Louisville <laughs> with a, a quick overnight on, on the way. The story that I'm about to share with you this evening is one that I've shared many times in person and in print and even on, on the radio at one point. This is my first time telling it in, here in my home state of Kentucky. I was born in Frankfurt and grew up about 20 miles north of Shelbyville, so I'm back in familiar territory tonight. It's good to be back in Louisville. I believe there's something hardwired into our, our nature to love stories. We remember that our Lord often taught in, in parables, those stories that were, uh, that he uh, presented to, pre to tie to a particular truth. And the story of salvation history that we receive through the church is the story of God's great love for his people. Each one of us has a story to tell. My purpose for being here tonight is to tell the story of the journey that led me into the Catholic Church. And also, I, I want each of you to be encouraged tonight to tell your own story. Even though I'm telling this through my own eyes, the story isn't really about me, but rather about God's grace working in my life. Every year around Christmas, I like to tell people that I grew up in Bethlehem, Kentucky. <laughs> and just like the song says, it, it is a little town. <laughs> for as long as I can remember and for generations prior to that, my family attended a small rural church along with my extended family on my dad's side. That church is of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ denomination, which, as many of you may know, has deep roots in Kentucky. The seminary for the diocese is in Lexington. Uh, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who was widowed before I was, was born, moved to be near us when I was very young. So I grew up with extended family on, on both sides around me. My grandmother uh, was of the Methodist tradition, so I had some exposure to also to the, the Methodist faith. And Bethlehem, Kentucky is the type of place where Christianity is central to community and, and family life. During my high school years, I began to have some questions about the faith that I wasn't really comfortable uh, asking my parents about. I'm not really sure why. They're both uh, people of, of great faith. But in the faith tradition that I grew up in, the answer to any question comes down to what does the Bible say about that? So I started studying the Bible on my own. And sometimes there were questions that I needed a little bit of guidance on. And thankfully, the Lord sent someone into my life at that time to serve as a mentor. He was a Methodist pastor in a neighboring town. And so often he and his wife welcomed me into their home whenever I had something to discuss. In the fall of 1993, I was in my senior year at Henry County High School. Some of you may remember the year 1993 as the Great Midwest Flood. During that year in, in the fall, there was a school holiday on a Friday, and the pastor of our church decided in, in advance to organize a, a youth service trip to the St. Louis area, since the state of Missouri was hard hit by the great Midwest flood. So we spent a couple days in just north of St. Louis doing some flood cleanup, but this turned out to be an, an unexpected encounter with the Catholic Church and my first real encounter because on the way home as we came along I-64 you may realize that as I-64 cuts across southern Indiana it goes through a little community called St. Meinrad. There's a seminary and a Benedictine community there and our pastor, yes a, a Protestant pastor interestingly enough, knew of it and thought it would be a good 
uh, unexpected, unplanned side trip for us to go to St. Meinrad. And we arrived there, uh, a Protestant pastor with a, a flock of teenagers close behind, just a few minutes late for Vespers. And I didn't know that that was the name of, of the service at, at the time. It wasn't so much the serenity of the place. St. Meinrad is a, a beautiful setting, or even the, the intrinsic beauty of the chanted liturgy that attracted me, but it, it was more the, the friendliness and the welcoming spirit of the, the people there, um, mostly lay people, who made sure that we had the books to, to follow along with, with the liturgy. Uh, they didn't seem to mind that we had arrived late or that we were dressed very casually. They welcomed us, and looking back on it, they were a perfect example of a, a line from the rule of St. Benedict, let all guests that come be received as Christ. Now, I didn't know about the rule of St. Benedict or the Liturgy of the Hours at that, at that time, but that experience stuck with me, my first real experience with the Catholic Church. When high school graduation time came, I received a scholarship to attend what was then known as Campbellsville College. It's now Campbellsville University. It was considerably smaller at that time. It's a Southern Baptist affiliate. For the first time at Campbellsville, I was surrounded by people of my own age who took their faith seriously and encouraged me to do likewise. In particular, I, I became involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, the FCA. Now, I was in a strongly Baptist environment at Campbellsville, but I didn't feel pressured to join that particular faith tradition. I began attending the local Methodist church in, in Campbellsville, and after a while, the youth director there asked me to serve as his assistant. Some people enter college with a definite career plan, and for other people, a plan emerges during those years. I didn't fit very well into either category. Three and a half years went by, and I changed majors a few times, and graduation day approached, and I still wasn't quite sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. I knew it was time, though, to get out of my comfort zone of Kentucky for a while. I had spent a few months one summer working at a camp in Massachusetts, so I knew the East Coast fairly well, but I decided this time to set my sights west. I heard about a Lutheran organization in Omaha, Nebraska that invited people, mostly recent college graduates, to serve for a year in various nonprofit organizations around Omaha in exchange for a place to live and, and a stipend for living expenses. Looking back on it, it's somewhat similar to the Catholic Worker House movement. It sounded intriguing, so one weekend in the early spring, I, I flew out to Omaha to check out the Lutheran Service Corps. When I arrived in the Omaha airport that night, uh, one of the current residents of, of the house was there to welcome me. Um, Carter was his name, a tall blonde man. Um, he took me out for a late night snack and he described the history of the uh, Lutheran Service Corps community. And he said something about that the house had once been a convent owned by the Catholic Church next door to it. Uh, it was a big two-story brick house with eight tiny bedrooms and even a chapel. When the parish had no longer needed the house to use as a convent, they had sold it to the Lutherans. But then Carter said something that stuck with me. He said that he thought of the many prayers that had been said by the sisters over the years in that house, and he believed the house was spiritually blessed by all the prayers that had arisen from it over the years. Over the course of that weekend, I decided this community would be a fit for me over the next year. So... By the time my plane landed in Louisville uh, on Sunday night, I knew that I would be back soon. And the following September, I moved into that repurposed convent on North 30th Street in North Omaha, along with four other people about my age and also a semi-retired Lutheran pastor who served as our resident spiritual director. The original plan there uh, was that my assignment would be with the local chapter of Habitat for Humanity, but instead they placed me with another Lutheran organization, Lutheran Family Services of, of Nebraska, a, a social ministry organization. With my business degree, it was a good fit for me to work at the corporate office in, in downtown Omaha, doing various things in, in the office. Now, only a few months prior to this, I'd been entirely unfamiliar with the Lutheran branch of Christianity, but here I was getting a crash course in it. Even so, I, I never felt a call to personally join the, the Lutheran faith either, although I, I definitely saw good things that they were doing, certainly with, with social ministry, and I was also drawn to, to liturgy. 
I heard, though, about an evangelical megachurch in West Omaha. It's not quite as large, to put it in Louisville terms, it's not quite as large as Southeast Christian, but it's like what Southeast Christian was 20 years ago. Um, and after the first visit there, I felt right at home. Um, for such a huge church, it was very warm and welcoming and seemed solid in, in doctrine, as I understood it. This church also had a large group of young singles who often had events going on on the weekends. So there's always something to do. And by the time I'd been there a few months, I was already serving as an usher on, on Sunday mornings. You'll, you'll notice a theme here is that I had no real loyalty to any particular faith tradition. Each evening, back at the Lutheran Service Corps house, uh, after we all returned from our work assignments, my housemates and I took turns preparing our evening meal, and once a month we had some sort of community building activity, like on one occasion we went to a Habitat for Humanity job site. But there was one of these monthly outings, we went on an overnight visit to a Benedictine retreat center in Schuyler, Nebraska, about 70 miles from I think, did I... Can you still hear me? I, okay. I heard this cut out for a moment. This is my first time using one of these McDonald's drive through gadgets, so I'm not quite familiar with their, uh, their operation. So that's right. Living in a former convent, visiting a Benedictine retreat center. You see where this is going. <laughs> But something about the St. Benedict Center fascinated me, and after, my, after that first visit, I went back on my own a few times. And remember, this was also my first, uh, or my second exposure to the, the Benedictine tradition. Well, on one of those visits, I wandered into the little bookstore there at the retreat center, and there was a book on a clearance table that caught my eye. Any Friend of God's is a Friend of Mine, a Biblical and Historical Explanation of the Catholic Doctrine of the Communion of Saints by Patrick Madrid. That's a mouthful of a title, but it sounded intriguing, so I bought it. But I didn't read it immediately, though. It, that would come much later. Now, I need to back up a little bit. About a year before I moved out to Omaha, while I was attending a friend's wedding, I met a beautiful young woman named Bonnie Peterson. We kept in touch and eventually began a relationship which had the challenge of living uh, in separate states. After I moved to Omaha, I made many weekend trips to St. Paul, Minnesota, where Bonnie was living and attending college at that time. When my year with the Lutheran Service Corps was drawing to a close, Lutheran Family Services offered me a full-time permanent position. Bonnie and I married the following summer, just after she graduated from college, and she joined me in my new hometown of Bellevue, Nebraska, um, which is best known as the home of Offutt Air Force Base. It's just south of Omaha. Until we were married, Bonnie and I had never lived in the same state at the same time. <laughs> Um, she also found a job with the Lutherans in a church preschool in, in Omaha, and we continued to attend the West Omaha Church and formed some great friendships with other young couples. Before long, though, Omaha seemed far away from our families, and we felt the urge to move a little bit closer. This is a challenge, of course, with one family in Wisconsin and one in Kentucky, but I accepted a position in the real estate accounting group at a life insurance company in it's Iowa, and another Louisville connection here, that company was Agon. I rented a tiny, ugly apartment in Rapids while Bonnie finished the school year in, in Omaha. And that summer, we bought an old fixer-upper house in the nearby town of Marion, Iowa. We didn't know it at the time, but the choice of that particular house triggered a series of events that would eventually draw us both into the Catholic Church. Across the fence from our new old house uh, was a larger house that had been divided into apartments. One Sunday afternoon, when we had been there just a fairly short time, I noticed a, a young man moving into one of the apartments, so I went over and introduced myself. Michael was a recent college graduate from Illinois who had just accepted a job in Cedar Rapids. Over the next few weeks, he came to our house often, and we had many good conversations together, but in one of those conversations, he mentioned that he was Catholic. Now, at this time, my exposure to the Catholic Church had been fairly limited, and I wanted to know about my neighbor's faith to be able to have conversations with him about it. So I remembered that book that I had picked up at the retreat center in Schuyler a year or so prior, and I started to read it, and I finished it. And with just this little hint of uneasiness, I, rem 
I realized that everything Patrick Madrid said in that book made sense. I knew that Catholics held Mary in, in high regard and had statues in their churches, both things that were somewhat foreign to, to my experience, well, very foreign to my experience. But Patrick Madrid made a compelling case why these practices aren't idolatry at all. He had included his email address in the back of the book, so I sent him a message and he graciously responded with some recommendations of other reading material. Now, I, I ordered a, a copy of a magazine and Envoy magazine, which I don't think is any longer in publication, but that was at, at the time a Catholic apologetics publication. All the while, I was telling myself, this is purely a quest for learning. <laughs> now, I don't claim to be a scholar, but when I have questions, I, I want to find answers. I'm, I'm, I'm driven to get to the bottom of, of a mystery, so I don't mind cracking open some books if that's what's needed. I discovered that Patrick Madrid had also written some other books and served as the editor of a book series called Surprised by Truth, which was a collection of stories written by people who had joined or returned to the Catholic Church. Now, I knew many people who had left the Catholic Church for other faith traditions, but I couldn't think of anybody I knew who had gone in the other direction. Did people really convert to Catholicism? Well, apparently so. And it wasn't just lay people. There was a ministry called the Coming Home Network that helped pastors from other branches of Christianity find their way into the Catholic Church. The name of that particular organization also resonated with me, the Coming Home Network. A common theme in the stories that I was reading was that for these people, becoming Catholic felt like coming back to a place where they belonged, even if they had never actually been there. One day at our home, I mentioned to neighbor Michael that I'd begun studying the Catholic Church in a purely academic way, of course. <laughs> he said, I'll be right back, and he went next door to his apartment, and he returned in, in a few minutes with a stack of books to, to loan to me. And this stack included um, a catechism, the Baltimore Catechism, and Butler's Lives of the Saints. Not long after that, Bonnie helped us slip the next piece of the puzzle in, into place. The husband of another teacher at the school where she was teaching at the time had also become interested in Catholicism. I was eager to compare notes with somebody else, so I called Mike. So yes, another, another Michael here. So I'll, I'll call him Mike to distinguish him from Michael the neighbor. We found that we had made some of the same discoveries. One Sunday afternoon, we sat in the cafe at Barnes and & Noble and, and discuss theology before we realized that four hours had gone by. <laughs> it was good to have a companion on this journey, but if this was a journey, where was it going? <laughs> Why would I want to be Catholic when I was comfortable where I was? Was there something in the Catholic Church that I needed? Was there something that I was looking for, longing for even, without even realizing it? What had started as a purely academic pursuit was making me more and more uncomfortable. Early in my studies, a couple of Latin terms came up, sola fide and sola scriptura, faith alone and, and scripture alone. I hadn't realized just how much my own understanding depended on, on these two concepts, especially sola scriptura, the belief that the Bible is the sole rule of, of faith for Christians. But how had the church functioned in those early years before the New Testament had been compiled as, as we know it today? And why had I never thought about that? Without knowing it, I had always approached the Bible in the way that many people do, as if it somehow dropped out of the sky on, on the day of Pentecost. But I soon found out in my study of church history that the canon of Scripture in the New Testament was still debated into the fourth century, many generations after the last of the apostles had died. I also became more and more aware that many intelligent faithful, godly people disagreed on their interpretation of the scriptures, and it wasn't always on just matters of opinion. Sometimes it was on key items like baptism, and it would be naive to think that these are just simply differences in perspective. These, these are, are big issues. At the same time, I realized how weak my knowledge of church history was. I had always assumed that the church went underground somehow in the early years when and corruption s slipped in, and then in the 16th century, Martin Luther and other reformers came along to, to save the day to bring true Christianity back. But 
as I continue to read conversion stories, this one troubling quotation kept popping up, one attributed to um, Cardinal John Henry Newman, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a big one. <laughs> Cardinal Newman, I soon learned, was himself a convert from the Anglican Church. Our neighbor Michael and I continued to have conversations by email after he moved away. His, his time in Iowa was, was fairly short. The topic that came up the most often was the Eucharist. Now, I had always understood communion or the as purely symbolic. We all knew that the elements were just tiny crackers, and, and the Lutherans used wine, but in, of course, in my faith tradition and, and some others that I think had been influenced by the temperance movement, we used Welch's grape juice. Uh, communion, in my understanding, was simply a memorial thing we did to, we did remember our Lord. But the idea that it was more than that was a new concept for me. There was one back and forth email sequence with neighbor Michael, former neighbor Michael at that point, where I, I quoted a passage from 1 Corinthians. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. And it wasn't until later that I realized those verses make no sense whatsoever if communion is purely symbolic. So I, I had just caught the seat of my pants on my own pitchfork with that one. And the other topic that I kept running into was apostolic succession. It caused me to think back to something that I had heard back during my college days at Campbellsville and from an unlikely source, a Latter-day Saints missionary. Somehow in, in a town that's as deep-fried Southern Baptist as Campbellsville, I had engaged in a conversation with some Mormons. Now Campbellsville University was at that time and still is a place where many Baptist pastors earn their undergraduate degrees. So the call to ministry was a familiar theme on, on campus among my friends. The analogy presented by my Mormon friend went something like this. Imagine your local ice cream truck driver is, is making his way through your neighborhood and he sees a police car and he thinks, now that's my true calling. So he gets a rotating strobe light and puts it on his ice cream truck along with a, a siren and he starts pulling people over and giving out speeding tickets. Well, those tickets aren't valid because no one has conferred upon him the legitimate authority to issue them. But no matter how called he may feel to being a police officer, he isn't. Now, at the time, I thought that was just a silly analogy. But looking back on it years later, I realized there was some truth to that. Taking a step back from apostolic succession, I saw that the underlying question was, what exactly is the church? I had always understood the church in, in the broadest sense of the word to be simply a collection of everyone who, everyone around the world who believed in and professed the Holy Trinity, no matter what label they might have put on their local assembly. But now, my studies were challenging this invisible church assumption. In particular, St. Ignatius of Antioch was often quoted. You've got to watch out for those church fathers. When you start getting into the church fathers, you realize just how Catholic the church looked in, in the early days. But St. Ignatius wrote, Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be, even as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic church. This is often cited as the first known use of, of the word Catholic to describe the church. And clearly from this, St. Ignatius understood the church as visible and hierarchical. At the same time, I ran across a line of scripture that I hadn't noticed before. Have you ever had that experience where you open up the scriptures and something just jumps out that it wasn't there before, but it must have been? <laughs> was from the first letter to St. Timothy, but if I should be delayed, you should know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. If anyone had asked me what was the pillar and foundation of truth, I would have said the Bible, of course, but here the Bible was saying that about the church. As if those two statements weren't enough, I'd started to even dig into Vatican II documents. So yeah, I, I was getting kind of serious with, with this purely academic study, but I ran across this line from Lumen Gentium, one of, the, one of the constitutions from the Second Vatican Council. 
This holy council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. Hence, they could not be saved who, knowing the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. Mic drop. (laughs) If I hadn't already known that I was in deep trouble, I did with that one. (laughs) So if the Roman Catholic Church truly was the living New Testament church, how could I remain outside of it? But what about Mary and purgatory and indulgences and the Pope and confession to a priest and veneration of relics and all those other obstacles that I saw them at that even at that time I still saw these as as obstacles and also this was the early 2000s and we all remember what was going on at that time when the Catholic Church was in the news constantly for less than honorable reasons there had to be some fatal flaw in, in Catholicism but no matter how hard I searched for it I couldn't find it now gradually our friends and family became aware of my studies and some of them were supportive others were clearly uneasy about it and and made their their uneasiness known to me about it. I hadn't realized until then just how many people had a bitter distaste for the Catholic Church. I remember one particular heated discussion at a friend's home in Minneapolis. This prompted him to send me an eight-page letter that described all the errors that he saw in in Catholicism. I responded to his page letter with a 20-page letter, single-spaced, with 73 footnotes. I think I put more effort in, into writing that letter than I ever did in a term paper in college. <laughs> and about the same time, people started sending me anti-Catholic materials in the mail, sometimes with no return address. Mike and his wife Kimberly, who had worked at the school where Bonnie was, were received into the Catholic Church in 2003. Around the same time, I heard that there would be a conference called Defending the Faith to be held that summer at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. I invited Mike to take a road trip with me to Ohio, and he agreed. So my quest, my my journey, was truly becoming a journey in a literal sense. From the afternoon we arrived in Steubenville, for the next two days, everything I had been studying over the past two years just just came to life. Steubenville is one of those places that um, you might approach and wonder, "Mm -hmm, would would anything remarkable come from here? And I mean no disrespect at all, but I I think of the opening line of the movie of To Kill a Mockingbird, where the, uh, the... uh, narrator it, it speaks of her hometown as a tired old town. Steubenville, Ohio, it looks you know on the surface like a tired old steel mill town, but when you step on the campus of Franciscan University, you know that there is something wonderful going on there. But at the conference, the speakers, the masses, holy hour, my first holy hour I ever attended on that Saturday night, it was almost too much to take in at once. But I don't want to make this sound like it was some sort of of religious emotional high. I had initially been drawn into the church by truth, or toward the church by truth, and then I began discovering goodness and beauty of the Catholic faith uh, in a way that I couldn't do by simply reading about it. Uh, For some people, that that process happens in reverse. They're initially drawn to the beauty and goodness within the church, and that leads them to truth. Uh, Bishop Barron often emphasizes to let beauty be the one that leads. But for me, that that happened in the order of truth leading me into the goodness and beauty, the, the three transcendentals, as those are often called. Remember that it was Patrick Madrid's book that had first um, started my interest in, in the Catholic Church. We were on a break between sessions at the conference, standing outside the bookstore, and guess who was standing next to me? I recognized him immediately. So I began a conversation with him. He was uh, he, Patrick Madrid is a, just a very gracious man. I, um, if you have the opportunity to meet him, I would encourage you to. Uh, Mike and I also had the chance to speak to Marcus Grodi from the Coming Home Network and also Scott Hahn, two gentlemen whose convergence and stories are are now legendary. Mike and I drove home on on Sunday from the conference. Somewhere along the way I said, I wonder who I should choose as my patron saint. And he just just laughed at me and said, do you realize what you just said? (laughs) But then a little while later I was taking my turn driving. He was reading his Bible and he was into Revelation. He read through uh, Revelation chapter 12, and he said, this says Mary is our mother. 
I knew that my journey had reached a point of no return. All the evidence aligned in the fav- in favor of the Catholic Church, but there were still some things I couldn't quite grasp, and there are still some things I don't quite grasp, and just have to pray for God for, to God for greater understanding of, of those things. But but once you've accepted apostolic succession in the Eucharist, you're there. You're, you're basically there. Everything else just falls into place once you have apostolic succession in the Eucharist in, in place. Mike and Kimberly had joined a large suburban uh, parish nearby. Appropriately enough, it, it was one that was named for a, a well-known convert, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. I called and set up an appointment with a pastoral associate there and told him my story. The time had come to to update our friends and family of, of what was going on and, and the decision I felt compelled to, to make. Most of our family responded, on, on both sides responded, well, that's, uh, that's a little weird, but okay, we, we trust you know what you're doing here. Some of our friends were less accepting of that. Some of the questions uh, that people asked were, were totally reasonable. Uh, questions like, what need was lacking in your life that you have found in Catholicism? And have you sincerely valued the Bible more than any other resource? There were some formerly close friends who drifted away, and and that's to be expected, I think. I was received into the Catholic Church at Easter Vigil Mass on April 10, 2004. Bonnie wasn't quite ready to join me at that time, but she came along to support me, and I'll always be thankful for that. Having read Scott and Kimberly Hahn's Rome Sweet Home, has to be the corniest book title ever, (laughs) but of the pain that, that Kimberly experienced when Scott left his Presbyterian ministry and, and joined the Catholic Church, and I didn't want that for Bonnie. I assured her that even if she never decided to become Catholic, that would be all right. She did uh, make her own journey into the church about two years later, and she has her own story to tell. That night, uh, when I was confirmed and received the Eucharist for the first time, my family wasn't there. And our friends weren't there, except for a few people we had met uh, along the journey. But I don't remember feeling any particular sadness about that. Looking back on that, that was a chance for me to say, Lord, I choose you. My family don't understand. Our friends don't understand. But I'm I'm trusting you here. I I choose you. A wise man uh, once said, it is impossible to be just to the Catholic Church. The moment men cease to pull against it, they feel a tug towards it. The moment they cease to shout it down, they begin to listen to it with pleasure. The moment they try to be fair to it, they begin to be fond of it. But when that affection has passed a certain point, it begins to take on the tragic and menacing grandeur of a great love affair. Tragic and menacing grandeur. People don't talk like that anymore. (laughs) Well, Mr. Chesterton nailed it with that one. I had lived in a, in a former convent. I had spent numerous nights in a Benedictine retreat center with the Blessed Sacrament right there in the building. I had started reading the Church Fathers and Vatican II documents. I had attended a Steubenville conference. There, there was just no way that I could resist that pull toward the Catholic Church. When I decide to do something, I, I tend to jump in with both feet. I went back to Steubenville that summer, and this time Bonnie came along with me. And I got involved with the planning of our diocesan men's conference, but that still wasn't enough. I wanted more. As a married man, I, I knew that the priesthood and religious life were no longer options for me, but maybe I could do something like be a pastoral associate or, or serve the church in some other vocational capacity. After, a year after I came into the church, I resigned from my job in order to work full-time on a master's degree in theology. I was confident that God would provide for our family's financial needs. Looking back on that, that was a really reckless thing to do. But at the time, it seemed right. The reality would prove much different. There are some Catholic colleges and universities that are faithful to church teaching. There are others uh, who have, that have embraced academic freedom at, at the expense of their Catholic identity. My time in, in Catholic academia was eye-opening, to say the least. So often, I heard people, even those with advanced theology degrees, questioning and even openly denying fundamental truths of the faith. <laughs> now, on occasion, I mustered up the courage to speak up, and that 
accomplished little more than getting me labeled as the troublemaker on campus. By the end of that year, I, I had had enough. I withdrew from the master's program and I just, I walked away defeated, wounded, broken, and unemployed. For the first time in, the, in this journey, I began to wonder if I made a huge mistake. The joy that I had experienced as a, a new Catholic convert faded away, and, and I was disappointed with the reality of being Catholic. I began to understand why people leave the church, um, especially in college. My, my growing collection of Catholic books got boxed up. But the one thing that I want you to hear, if, if you hear only one thing I say tonight, let it be this, that no matter how discouraged I was, I never seriously considered leaving the church. Because somehow I knew that what I had experienced was real. Somehow I knew that what I had experienced back in Steubenville and through the witness of the faithful Catholics in Cedar Rapids had substance to it. It was real. The words of, of St. Peter uh, to our Lord, probably the, the most profound, or at least one of the most profound theological statements ever, ever spoken, came to me. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else could I go but to the, chor the church founded by our Lord himself? Besides that, there was no way that I was going to admit that all the people who had tried to keep me out of the church had been right all along. And there was one other thing to consider, too. Bonnie had just entered RCIA. So no matter how discouraged I felt, I, I knew that I had to fulfill my, my God-given role as the spiritual leader of our household. Being a full-time student had left a six-month gap in my employment history. I applied for a number of jobs and received a series of those thank you for your interest letters. The Cedar Rapids Police Department was recruiting new officers at the time. I had always had an interest in law enforcement, so I applied and made it fairly far into the process, but not quite far enough. This was one of a series of, of dead ends. For the interim, I started working security, and I eventually ended up patrolling a community college campus on night shifts. I would say that was the lowest point in my life. Most of the time, God seemed distant. And my prayers, if you can even call them like that, sounded something like, I trusted you, Lord. Why aren't you here? Surely there's something more. I gave up everything for you, and, and this is what I get? I've come to realize that as men, we derive a lot of our identity from our work. And sometimes this, this part of our nature can become distorted to the point that it drives us to overachieve and, and work at the expense of other things, like family commitments. But when our vocational identity is attacked or, or somehow taken away, it, it strikes at the core of, of our existence. I particularly like the, the feast of, of St. Joseph the Worker. I, I have an, an icon of St. Joseph the Worker hanging on, you know, on the pegboard among my tools in, in my garage. Um, at the time, though, I, I felt like such a failure. My efforts to serve the church in a vocational capacity had crashed and burned, and my business career appeared to be ruined as well. I think, though, what kept me from completely losing my bearings during that time was I continued to attend Mass and receive the Eucharist and, and to go to reconciliation, even when I didn't feel like it. The sacraments gave me the strength to continue learning the faith, not, not just learning about it, but learning the faith, internalizing it. My formation slacked off, but it didn't stop entirely. I began to recognize that in any institution like the Catholic Church, made up of human beings, every one of them is as imperfect as me, there is some disorder uh, to be expected. Hoping this doesn't sound too cliche, the darkest point of nine is right before the dawn. One cold January day, I received a phone call from a staffing agency where I had applied. A nonprofit organization in Cedar Rapids needed someone with my skills on a short-term basis to audit some files. That position was expected to last about six months. I stayed there a little over seven years <laughs> and worked my way up to the role of assistant controller. So it, it felt good to be alive again is the best way I, I can put that. With my professional life back on track, it was time to reassess my journey as, as a Catholic man. I had joined the, the Knights of Columbus a few years ago, and I noticed Deacon Derek is wearing his Knights of Columbus shirt here, here tonight. I, I joined the Knights during the, one of those uh, 
really the, the darkest part of, of this time that, that I spoke of. I began to attend meetings more often though, and before long, I was invited to be a local council officer, and then district warden, and then district deputy. And then came our state convention in Des Moines in 2016. Somewhat to my surprise, I was chosen as one of eight delegates to represent Iowa at the Knights of Columbus Supreme Convention in, in Toronto, Ontario. That was truly the experience of a lifetime. Uh, any, uh, any of the gentlemen here tonight who are, are Knights, if you ever have the opportunity to attend a Supreme Convention, do it. It, um, it was... It was an experience where we're seeing so many cardinals and, and bishops and priests and deacons and lay people from as far away as the Philippines and, and Poland all gathered together. It reminded me just of how, of how Catholic in the lowercase c, the most literal sense of the word, universal, that the church really is. I first gave this talk at our home parish in, in Cedar Rapids in May of 2018. This turned out to be quite the year for us. Uh, um, soon afterward, I received a call to interview for a position with the Diocese of, of Madison, Wisconsin. That summer, the Diocese of Madison offered me the position, so after 17 years in Iowa, Bonnie and I prepared to move again, and this time back to her home state. I've been with the Diocese just over three years now, and it's been a wonderful the year 2018 was not without its share of sorrows, though. Uh, in September of that year, uh, my nephew was killed in a car accident here in Louisville on, on his way to work. And then on Thanksgiving weekend 2018, our beloved Bishop Robert Morlino, Bishop of Madison, died unexpectedly. The past year and a half have been challenging uh, for all of us, but Bonnie and I have really been blessed. Uh, Bonnie is teaching kindergarten at a Catholic school in a, a, another small town near our home. We live in, in another small town just, just outside of Madison. We're enjoying being closer to our families. This past year, I was able to finally, after all those years, restart my graduate studies. So I'm now working on my master's degree in theology on online through Franciscan University. <laughs> 18 years after I first stepped onto the campus at Steubenville, now I'm a student, although entirely online. And then in August, I received another important phone call. This one brought the news that I've been accepted in, into formation for the permanent diaconate for the Diocese of Madison. <laughs> when you're tempted to think that God is finished with you, be assured, he isn't. Just as, as an aside, uh, a few months ago I, I had the opportunity to attend a, a Catholic men's retreat and, and camping trip that, that occurs every year in, in Oklahoma. And once again, it's on the grounds of a Benedictine Abbey. You see this theme going on here. From the very beginning of my journey, it seems like the Benedictine tradition has been there. And then Franciscan University also. I, I, of course, I'm, I'm studying you know, Thomas Aquinas in, you know, in my graduate studies, so we're working the Dominican tradition in there as well, so getting a little bit of all the, the uh, religious traditions there. But I, I just think that's interesting how the Benedictine tradition was at the very beginning and in the middle and on the, the camp out with the... And I'll, I'll put in a, a little bit of a shout out to the, the Catholic Man Show. It's uh, two gentlemen two, who are considerably younger than me, but two gentlemen in the Diocese of Tulsa who started a radio show. And uh, so they have an annual camp out every year that I've really been blessed to, uh, to be a, a part of for the last couple of years. But that's just one more opportunity of embracing my identity as a Catholic man, finding out what that looks like. I haven't departed from the Christianity of, of my early life, that firm grounding in scripture that, that I received in my rural Kentucky upbringing, and the bold witness of my friends in college at Campbellsville, uh, the respect for liturgy and social ministry that I learned from the Lutherans, uh, the evangelist zeal that I experienced at my mega church in, in Omaha. All these experiences coalesced in, into... Uh, to preparing me for a deeper expression of Christianity in a place that I once thought would be the most unlikely, the Roman Catholic Church. Our church is our Lord's continued presence on, on earth as, as priest and prophet and king. He promised that his church would endure, and we serve a God who keeps his promises. I don't know where this journey will lead next, but by God's boundless grace, my way home, you know, I'll, I'll re-emphasize that one point that 
time when I thought God stopped writing my story, but he hadn't. And if you're here tonight thinking that God is finished with you, he isn't. You're here for me. And if you find yourself in, in the depths of one of those dark times like, like I experienced, just, just wait on the Lord. Read, read Psalm 40. That's, that's a favorite of mine. Read, read Psalm 40. You know, I, I waited for the Lord. He heard my cry. God isn't finished with you. You have a story to tell. Write it down. And go out and tell it. So thank you for welcoming me into your, your parish here tonight. Once again, uh, it's, it's such a blessing to be back here in Louisville, you know, very familiar territory, and uh, just really a, a great honor to be here with, with all of you. So, so thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Donna? Wow, what a move of the Holy Spirit in your life, Russell. How exciting that the journey home thought so too, enough to print your story in, in their newsletter that goes out to thousands of people. Thank you so much for making the trip to Louisville and for being our guest speaker tonight. Well, I challenge all of you, just as Russell did, to share your own story. We all have a story of how God has worked in our lives. Some of our stories are pretty exciting, like Russell's. Some maybe not so much, but you never know how they might touch someone. So don't forget to come to the hospitality room after the closing song, and hopefully you will have a chance to visit with Russell and Bonnie. I just want to say our next event is February 20th, you might want to mark that on your calendar. Uh, we're in the process of planning that event right now. Uh, Colleen Balderson, who's a member of our parish, will be our speaker. Uh, so be sure to mark that down and watch the bulletin for more information. We are blessed that once again, Michael Bartley and his daughters, Grace and Sarah, are with us to close out this part of the evening with a beautiful song that Russell chose called A Rightful Place by Steve Agrisano. We're always grateful to the Bartleys each time that they're able to be here and lead us in the closing song. Um, so would you please stand and join the Bartleys in singing A Rightful Place. And thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>